Welcome to everyone to the Capital Insider Series here today, organized by Entrepreneur, as we delve today into the Digital India's big promise and accessible opportunity. India. We joined by the startup veteran, Mr. T. V. Mohandas, uh, who is the co-founder and chairman of Arlene Capital, as also the chairman of Manipal Global Education. So, of course, both as an investor and as a startup uh, thought leader, and uh, you know, a man with huge experience. Uh, understanding the startups as well uh, as well as working closely with startups he understands both sides of the coin the entrepreneur's pain point as well as the investors growth metrics in today's and particularly in today's discussion we're going to connect the dots today between the sustainability while leveraging the larger di digital opportunity for startups so uh, you know welcome mr pai and we are it's wonderful to have you here joining us today um, as we sort of discuss with you further on how will digital India really fuel the opportunity for Startup India as we go ahead. So let me start by asking you this, that, you know, while digitization will um, drive the economics for a lot of big tech companies today, you know, uh, there would be a lot of products, a lot of softwares they would have that they would offer to the, uh, particularly to the legacy businesses as well as large corporates who are looking to change. But what do you feel is the big opportunity for startup, uh, startups who are in particularly in enterprise tech space or B2B space who are looking to help in the digital transformation? So what are the sectors or trends the, um, you foresee over there? Well, if you are in the B2B space, I think legacy businesses are businesses with a non-digital in the real world have understood that they have to go digital in fact, one of our companies, Darwin Box, said they had the best ever quarter last, last quarter. One. Then they said everybody in business wants to go digital. They're in the HR space. And third, they said we're getting many more meetings than earlier. We don't have to travel. And fourth, people are used to getting digital implementation done remotely. So I think the yes. world has changed. There's enormous amount of interest today. And people want good products to help them go digital become more efficient, connect to customers and lower their costs. So I think the B2B space, there's an explosion of companies which are ready, uh, which are already there, et cetera. B2C, you are seeing that they've grown up 2X to 3X in the last seven, eight yeah. months, which has been remarkable. So I think B2B is also doing well. The key is how can you implement your B2B software very fast, very easily? Do you have the APIs and others to take through people? Do you have a back end which can be very efficient to bring people on board? And will you make sure they see the results as early as possible? So everybody wants to be with the cloud architecture. They want to be with a good interface, API based. I think that's the key to success in this new world. Sure, sir. Um, so, you know, while the opportunity is very big, but I also feel that today's large enterprises or even traditional businesses in India, they want to do digital transformation. That's for yeah. sure. And, you know, but it's a major undertaking for them, so to say, you know, how, so how would you invest them today to invest uh, or advise them today to invest in all these uh, digital changeover that they want to do by improving their workflows, you know, or scaling their processes to become more digital and particularly how can startups work with, um, you know, these businesses, family businesses, um, manufacturing businesses today to help them ensure this changeover happens smoothly for them. Well, you know, when the lockdown happened, what really happened? Everything came to a standstill. Everything came to a standstill. The only thing that really worked were the digital companies who already had an interface with customers and who already had a back end of delivery. That means they had a back end supply chain, efficient supply chain, and uh, they had a front end which are very digital and they grew with everybody turned on the digital tap and started interacting, correct? You saw the payments yeah. go up to $2.1 billion. You saw the e-commerce go up, et cetera. Now, what do you do with steel companies? What do you do with cement companies, et cetera? For all the cement companies and steel companies, <coughs> the factories were shut down. Everybody went home and interaction with the customer supply chain came down. So what should they do? They should interact with a lot of their distributors and get them on board to be digital. So their people don't have to travel. The orders flow through. They know what is happening. All the information goes through. I think they've done it remarkably. For example, Havels made sure that they had their interaction with all their distribution chain digitally in a short period of time and everybody was helped to come on digital. So distribution chain should be digitized. And the distribution chain is in touch with consumers. And of course, so 
consumers who touch point who touch point is the distributor are able to interact because the distribution chain is smaller than dealing with the manufacturer so your distribution chain should be done second thing is your support system like finance hr etc people are all working from home so you must make sure that everything that you do you need got the work tools the cyber security and everything to allow them to work from home and remotely connect and it was done in most enterprises and people came along and there there are many startups who could help them give them cyber security give them the hr stuff give them the finance stuff and make them work third the actual production the much of the actual production is also automated today yes a very large number are uh, physical interfaces and there is a problem because the physical interfaces required a lot of people to come etc and we saw the car manufacturers everybody put in social distancing uh, get uh, people to work in shifts start off with 25 30% 40% and make sure that they automate as much as possible that i think is come back to normal people have learned how to live with it with masking and social distancing they're able to make sure that the infection doesn't spread and people are safe and when they get infected they got uh, medical advice and they got medical access to help keep them alive and make sure they recover very rapidly because there are too many things government will shut it down we know that and the next thing which is very important is that how is the consumer behavior now consumers have started buying goods and services from them physically they don't have to go to the dealer they interact with the dealer and the dealer distributes it <coughs> and delivers to the doorstep and the finance and everything is fully automated so the distribution chain is there for them so manufacturing has got automated people have learned to leave the back office functions are all at work from home and this is how the new model is going to be yes people are going to come to office many many more will come maybe 60 70% will come to office 25 to 30% 40% will always be work from home depending upon sure. who you are and what you are so work from home is going to be a new normal not for 100% for a very important different reason 100% of those who are able to work from home because 100% of people don't live in a house or have space in the house where they can have a home office you know because Absolutely. you know you got a small house a small room you know you got children screaming at the back end i'm sorry children <laughs> shouting at the back end your family going round and everybody is disturbed you don't get the silence you don't get that concentration activity people are fed up people want to go to office but say you no know, uh, ritu ritu the senior people love it very much because earlier before this work from home came senior people didn't like work from home because for them they want to see everybody in front of their eyes they want to meet them talk to them they didn't like work from home now when they started work from home because of compulsion they loved it because they don't have to travel to and fro they don't have to go anywhere they are in the comfort of their house they get home food they are taken care of and they have a lot of space in the house their spouses work in one corner they work in one corner and they are mostly empty nesters if you pass 45 you are mostly an empty nester right your children are grown up and uh, all that has made sure that you are more comfortable you don't want to go back right so the roles are now reverse younger people want to come the older people don't want to come back senior people but they will adjust to the new normal so i think if you look at how the work has been distributed uh, all the startups who are in b2b can see where things are and go uh, market to them and today we learn from everybody that they're getting more time with the decision makers easily and all decision makers want to touch base electronically they decide electronically they are in a hurry and all ceos and boards are very clear go digital immediately digital first mobile first that is the mandate from everybody because they find that uh, they can get greater benefits they can get access to information etc and all boards of listed companies and non listed companies when they meet they ask you how are you gone digital how is work from home how is it working what are the risk mitigation measures have you spent money have you invested they are approving all the investments so the world has changed and this is how you must interact but the key thing is you must remember that users have different levels of sophistication and users have different level of ease of use so you should when you sell you should make sure you tell them not how great your product is but how well this will work for them and how easy it's to implement and how you'll train the people and reduce the pain because earlier they used to talk to you make you come make you sign a 500 page document and all that which most of them signed blindly anyway and uh, never took care of the risk but they are actually very eager and most of the b2b startup we are interested in told us that they're getting better meetings deal closures happening faster they all want to go digital they're winning deals they're implementing they're working but the key is to look at it from the customer point of view not your point of view very many startups make a mistake of presenting how great a company they are what great technology how it works 
but as a user what am i interested in how can i use it fast how can i make it work fast how useful it is to me how can i train my people and how uh, it will benefit me i'm not concerned about what how great you are right and that the mistake was not made so i think this is Absolutely. what uh, this is what uh, we should uh, uh, we should we should look at and work sure so, uh, so mr pai you just talked about you know the digitization of the distribution system and i was uh, just yesterday i was reading this report about social commerce uh, becoming you know as high as uh, uh, 28 billion probably a few years down the line by maybe 2025 so do you see uh, the digitization of the distribution system will be the outcome of this growth or how do you see the entire structure changing for social commerce to become that big well i think social commerce is the interaction with people right so wherever there's people interaction social commerce will come in and mostly it is in the distribution and supply chain now that is getting fully uh, automated and there are so many apps there's so much of software available there see ritu the good thing you must understand is enterprise are finding that there are a lot of good apps lot of young companies who can come and help them they never knew there's so many of them the competition intense they don't have to go to the big legacy uh you know technology players who charge your arm and leg and make it very complex because with cloud you don't require to set up a data center is all available with a saas model you don't have to pay so much about friend money you can pay a monthly subscription based upon use and all the startups are charging very low money i hope they charge more where they too need to make money their investors are now subsidizing all these enterprises because they want to capture territory but i think the key is the method of selling the method of pricing everything is gone the consumer way right when everything is gone the consumer way is up to you to make a use of it so i think the competitive intensity intensity has gone up so social e-commerce is going up but don't get carried away by all those numbers by consultants we have the same set of four or five consultants write the same set of report for all things if you add up all the business from everybody is about 3 to 4 times india's gdp but the fact is fact remains opportunity is big how big is for you to discover and put into play sure. you know beyond a billion dollars business for anybody whether it's a billion a 100 billion or 20 billion 30 billion all you're interested in is am i making the sale am i getting the money now because so many people are selling and uh, the startups haven't learned how to sell because the culture for them is an engineering culture not a sales culture you have to develop a sales culture you must learn that the only person who gives money to you is the customer and the customer must pay for it correct you sell steel there the customer to buy the customer has to pay and you are going to charge the customer you are not going to be uh, you know uh, what do you call it very kind to him kind to the customer you want to make them pay what are the market price because when the market comes down they are not going to give you higher prices correct so you have to make sure that you are able to sell and you should not use price as a first step you should use the ease of use the benefits and how quickly you can do it at the first step and then the price don't discount too much give them greater service hand over them make them feel comfortable and charge them what you think is the right price because i think it's important for people to understand this because once you have an install base and you charge them it's very difficult to raise the price very very difficult to raise the price you can't raise the price i agree because you and if you give it contract perfect, and all it's that it's absolutely difficult to ask people to pay for it yeah i mean you know indians are not used to paying so much for technology whereas in america and other places you know they know how to sell mm. and they pay for That's value right. in india they still don't pay for value except you are a big mnc you come and uh, wave the flag and all some people get impressed and pay a lot of money uh, but you know even though they sign on the contract they may not pay the money at all in the end they may pay a little bit of it and stop or whatever it is so i think you must price it properly and make sure that you uh, wow the customer so how do you think the startups should in india particularly they should change their narrative to be able to sort of go from you know my product is that great to you know this is how i can make your company great so what do they need to do to sort of get well, those customers well i think they need to have it? a cultural change they need to create a marketing and sales strategy a sure. marketing strategy to make improve their brand and make them attractive by talking to people like you writing articles in your media and other places and creating excitement using social media blah 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 to create a pull factor then create sure. a sales team to have a push factor and for all of them we tell them very clearly that you have you got to invest more in the marketing and sales not in discounting prices and giving away things free and say uncle use it now and pay me later that's not going to work but it was going to give you money after all very soon in saas companies and all the startup people are looking at multiple of sales not multiple of losses correct 
those days are going Correct. because today all the venture capitalists and everybody who invest a lot of money who's got a lot of money to burn are become much more careful they're looking at winners and they're waiting for the winners to come they're not waiting for you to lose more money and go to them and ask for money so money is in short supply except for the winners because very clearly the last 6 months have shown who are the winners who are the has beens so there is a churn that's going to happen and if you want to win you got to make sure that you're able to create a good revenue stream and a good arr and that will demonstrate how good it is and if you're able to pull it off and have fru leave frugally not overspend so your biggest investment you got to make is in sales and marketing i think you know sure, many yeah. of the founders in b2b don't invest adequately in sales and marketing because all of them are started by good engineers they think the product itself will sell the product itself will sell when it is uh, free in a b2c where a lot of people can use it and they can go from product to product right and b2c the game is to get as many installed as possible as many monthly active users as possible and then monetize people understand that in b2b that's not the model b2b you actually have to sell make them use it and they have to pay for it and everybody is going to look at you as a multiple of revenue not a multiple of losses a multiple of eyeballs so b2b is very different from b2c no i agree but uh, you know you the chairman of uh, manipal education and you know today we see white hat junior being very aggressive with their sales and that's sort of also getting uh, you know them into trouble um, no, the misleading that, sales you know, there i mean uh, they yes. clearly misselling i mean you can't tell a 6 year old kid oh you're going to be like a you know ceo of uh, uh, sundar pichai or you're going to be uh, somebody else who's going to be big you know remember there is only one bill gates in the world there's only one sundar pichai everybody cannot be a sundar pichai everybody cannot be that you can aspire to be but you're not going to be so let's be very clear the chance occurrence and it happened because of circumstances and you know there are very very good coders it's not necessary that you are the only best coder in the world and when you right. got uh, 10 kids who are very very good at top of the pyramid yes they could be good coders when you got thousands and thousands everybody is not going to be a great coder it's going to become a commodity right you can missell i think there have been a lot of misselling that is happening and i think uh, you know they regretting it because people are going after them because you missell and put this dollar sign in front of the eyes of the parents and then you tell your kid i'll make you a superstar every kid is not going to become a superstar i mean you know learning coding sure. doing coding is extremely hard work that's why there's so few successful tech entrepreneurs there are millions of people but very few successful tech entrepreneurs and great tech is right sure so you know i mean how do you see so you work so closely with the government of india and uh, you know you work with their policy framework so how how do you think the government is going to be actively involved in creating opportunities for startups you know particularly to do collaborations with uh, government organizations particularly you know the public sector units or or even established businesses in india to sort of help them digitize seamlessly profitably well the government has a vision of digitizing prime minister modi has given the digital india so that's a mandate and everybody is trying to digitize the key is how do they work with people now government is stuck in processes they have to go to a tender vendor and all that mess they have to take the lowest and all that of course you got the world bank thing where you give more marks for quality and less marks for price uh, for the price and they're very scared to deal with uh, smaller companies but luckily for us the meti has uh, and niti ayog has made sure that in all government contracts uh, you know they remove the condition of uh, prior experience they remove the condition of certain revenues being there they remove the condition of uh, you know having so many installs and they also open to startups and if you are not open to startups you can go to the government portal and put it up and you know everybody has to go there and you can compete you get a chance is it working is working much better than it did earlier because remember in all governments consultants have rigged the system the big consultants come together and rig the system by putting in barriers you got to have 200 crore investing you know you got to have so many so who is going to have it if we don't get an opportunity how are you going to get there government has tried right. to remove that in many cases they removed it but they still there you got to fight it out expose them write in the media that this is unfair tweet to ravi shankar prasad and meti and all that and break it down because you know those are barriers put up by these consultants and then they get their own clients to bid and then go consult for them and tell them how to win the deal i mean there is no chinese wall in many of the things is a total abuse of the system and everybody is part of the gravy train everybody there is part of the gravy train we know that happening in a very big way for the last 20 years we seen that happening even when we are selling in the services companies we saw all the big mnc's used to come corrupt the entire system and put up barriers 
and a very easy way to get the barriers, get the consultant put up for qualification barriers, knowing very well only they will qualify. And some of them have been done very, very openly. So I think the key is because of social media, you should expose everybody and uh, win it through and you fight the battle and hopefully you'll get it. So it's much more open today than otherwise. So the private sector is also much more open. In private sector, it's not like the government. You know, they're willing to uh, sign up. They're willing to do things. So you must go sell. That's why you must invest in good marketing salespeople. And the best way to invest in marketing salespeople is to hire the people who have got the Rolodex. I don't know whether young people understand what is the Rolodex now. It's a old marketing term. You know, it is a container where you have the cards of all the people you have met and whom you can call up and send an email and will respond to you, right? That's the Rolodex. So you got to get people who have been selling and everybody else. You just, you can't pick a marketing MBA and say, hey, go and sell. Because, you know, nobody knows him. Nobody will open the door. You'll not do that. You got to pick people who already build the relationship, who can call up people, who know the market, get them from the big tech companies, get them from otherwise. That's why you need to spend money on that. And once you attract them and give them option, many of them will come. And then uh, you don't have to do this. I remember a conversation I had with, uh, you know, you know uh, with, with a very big uh, CEO of a very, very big European bank. When I met him and said, hey, we want to work with you, we want to do this. He said, Mohan, do one thing, find out who is the best guy who's selling in this business, who has done the most sales. Offer him 25% more and grab him and ask him to go sell. That's the only way to sell. He said, when you go to a new market, you find out who are the best guys, pay them more, get them on board, and we are in business. Because, you know, these sure. guys, all the startups hire a rookie. One of the founders, you know, said, I'll do marketing. I mean, nobody knows you, man. Nobody knows who you are, what you are, and all that. And you go before a big company and you do blah, 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 blah. You don't know what to talk. You don't know what to do. You're not going to win the deal. And you mm -hmm. can't tell him, uncle, look at this white tech. It's so beautiful. Look at this app, blah, blah, blah. That doesn't work. All right. There's the selling language, everything has to be done. But the best way is to get people who have done it before, who have sold enterprise sure. products. Selling to enterprise is an art in itself. It's not easy. It's an art in itself. Absolutely. Yeah. So do you think the narrator moves from marketing to sales for startups and uh, therefore they should they, uh, be putting more monies in getting good salespeople on board instead of just burning yeah. a lot of money on social media? Yes, I think so. Because, you know, when they go to social media, they're feeding the big monopolies and the big beasts. They feed Facebook, they feed Twitter, they feed Google. you got to understand, even the Google says, I'm going to get you everything. Google will only put people who pay them the most money, right? I mean, you come up in the list, the fellow who pays more money comes up first. That's a very manipulative technology that they're using for marketing. Nobody's doing you a favor. Google is a business to make obscene amounts of money. Facebook is the best obscene amount of money. Whoever pays more, they put them first. And the thing that anybody who goes there and Googles will get this name first and will go to them, right? So you got to be very smart to know how the algorithm works, what works and how it is too. So the way to do it is, yes, you are on digital media. You should be in the media. You should be on Twitter and tweet about your product. Yes, you got to have publicity. You got to talk to people like you to write nice articles about them. And there are a lot of these digital media who can write and spend some money. I don't know why they're not, uh, you know, advertising on your media more and, uh, you know, your story and all the digital media more, which have got so many eyeballs. Advertise them, spend a little bit of money. Because by supporting them, you are enhancing your digital footprint. Correct? Instead of feeding the big beasts who are monopolies, right? Because you have your own network, you have your own uh, constituency, and if you become a very big distributor, people will have an alternative. They must do that. And then they must do cold calling. Cold calling, sending emails to senior people, calling them up and speaking to them. People still uh, use telephones in this country. Senior people do. And write them letters to and give them some brochures. Go to big events where people come, introduce themselves. Selling is an art. Totally. Selling cannot be done by everybody. Marketing can like be done to tell by you that you're the people. first person who said it in the entire pandemic. I've spoken to so many people, but you're the first one who's come out right and said that, you know, step up the sales. No, no, because, you know, marketing can be done by a lot of bright people who don't know how to talk or mumble, right? Because they yeah. have to create creative, they have to think strategy, they have to distribute. It's like asset allocation. But selling is actually one-on-one. -on -one. Selling is an art. It's very frustrating. You need to have per perseverance, energy, optimism. And for enterprise, a long lead cycle. Whereas B2C, you okay. put up a thing and something, it takes off and all, everybody will download, you get, your oh, I've done it myself. B2B, you're dealing one-on-one -on -one and you got to try it out. You require patience, you require perseverance, you require connections, you require follow-up, you need to understand, you got to be extremely polite, 
uh, people may argue about you, throw you out of the office. You've got to keep coming back and say, kick me more, kick me more and willing. You know, it's a very difficult job. It's not an easy job for everybody. And, you know, yeah. fortunately, a lot of people have the inclination for sales. They like meeting people. They like taking up the challenge. They are aggressive and quiet by nature. Aggressive means they've got the energy to do it again and again and again. We see, we're all built very differently. You can't have an introvert or the salesperson. It's got to be an extrovert. Correct? In so America, talking. and I'll tell you, that we don't have the culture of sales. If you get an American today and ask him to sell that $25 stuff for $100, they'll sell it for $100 and make the client feel very, very happy. They've got a great deal. An Indian will sell a $100 stuff for $25 to a client and feel sorry for the customer. You don't feel sorry for the customer. You see, feel sorry for yourself first. Because you're not making the kind of money you should be making. Only you feel sorry for yourself, you get more energy. Hey, let me try. Let me do it, right? So you've yeah. got to be very careful. The culture of selling is a very different outgoing culture. You've got to be positive. People will push you around. People will abuse you. People will throw you. you still got to keep coming back. You've got to, you know, earlier you used to have dinners and take people out and all that, blah, 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 to create the social thing. You should know how to make conversation so they keep people happy to create mind recall. It's a very difficult business. So you've got to get these trained people to do it. And if you're in a hurry, get people who've done it before. Pay them more money and do it. And they'll be much more productive. They'll be much more productive. And legacy companies have got a lot of them. For example, at Infosys, when we were growing first in the 19, early 80s, we took the best people from Hindustan Lever and all the FNCG companies because they were the brightest of the lot. They knew how to talk. They had body, they had gravitas, they had body language, and they could think, they could do everything else. And they were very good. And they could be sent them to the US and they all worked because they could connect with customers. They knew how to connect. We didn't have to train them. We didn't pick rookies from IAMs and say, hey, go and work. It's not going to work. So do you feel that particularly people in sales uh, roles who might have lost jobs in the traditional sectors or you know, even, even large corporates, they, they are likely to find more jobs in the startup sector? Yeah, they should. They should, you should target them and pick them. But you've got to be careful that you don't get uh, people who are not done well. Sure. So how do you feel the overall, the from a collective ecosystem point of view of digital mobilization that needs to take place? What new work opportunities do you see happening for India's workforce? Well, you know, I'll tell you, there are two kinds of workforce. The young people, 22 to 28, who are all bought up in the digital world. They're mobile first, digital first, they think very differently. And people who worked in the earlier legacy world, they think differently, right? I mean, you talk to a young 15-year-old person, I mean, they think very differently, right? They're all about apps, about connectivity. They go to their handle device. They know how to buy stuff. They know how to do stuff. They know where the deals are. Uh, my, my younger son, you know, when he was in college, he was so proud. He earned two and a half, three lakh rupees by getting cash back from everybody. He had no loyalty. Whoever gave more cash back, he took the money. And people, uh, Paytm and others, we are giving dollops of cash because the Chinese had poor money and they were giving it away. It's a very good thing to do. <laughs> so everybody got cash back, this back. It's a great thing. And young kids made the most of it, right? They got so many things. They made so much of money. They got deep discounts. Because all these B2C thought that they're giving more and more discounts, etc. I remember one day, there was a great deal of excitement in the office because everybody was trying to buy IMAX and uh, Apple, this one, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> laptops and everything. I said, why? Oh, this is giving us a 20% discount. And there's a company in Delhi I mean, you, you buy from Apple at 100 and give it at 80, you can sell the whole world, man. You can sell That's it to the true. whole world. Everybody will cure because they know it's an Apple product. You're getting yeah. it cheaper than Apple. And 20% is a good deal. Everybody, uncle, will buy. Then you've got GMB, some great thing called GMB, and say, hey, hey, we did it. Yeah, we lost a billion dollars, but we did it, did it. Next day, what happened? Somebody who gives 25% discount will sell. Is a race to the bottom, right? Yeah. True. Race to the bottom. Well, many have done it just to get more and more people to come to the portals. They can cross sell, do everything. Well, I don't want to comment on the strategy, whether it's good or bad or whatever it is, but it is what it is. And I think many of them have been successful in blowing up that money, but getting a lot of eyeballs and they've been successful in doing that, which is good news. But I think B2B is not like that. B2B is very, very different. So B2B and B2C are two different things, but B2C okay. gets more valuation. Yes. Because you can show growth, you can show uh, great uh, eyeballs, you can show great connectivity, but you've got to be extremely careful because there's a lot of competition and now investors are getting smarter. 
but i mean overall don't you see i mean from, from what the trends that i have been seeing more unicorns are actually being built in faster than uh, they were being built in uh, you know back in 2011 12 in e-commerce we see seeing saas and you know those um, uh, artificial intelligence those companies becoming and growing much faster much sooner well there some of them the are growing much faster much sooner because i think there there's a much more concentration of capital coming in so they're able to really spend on marketing and grow and there's a greater attraction for users of the technology because everybody wants to digitize so the market is moving in your favor when the market moves in the favor when you've got capital at call you know you're going to do better you got to do all the right things and you do things much much better there have been unicorns in 2 years 3 years 4 years right earlier it just take a lot of time so they've been unicorns 2 years 3 years 3 4 years but you got to make sure that you stick to the narrow path and you don't uh, miss the opportunity and don't believe that you're the greatest greatest company since creation right is a competitive market you're still not the numero you know yes you've grown up but be careful get more and more customers because b2b is a very sticky business b2c is not so sticky yeah, yeah. in my view b2b is very sticky because once people use a the software they install it they can't easily change because change it was no, buying the, something the, else the, the bigger worry for me is that you know would they be able to service because you know if you see a startup growing to a unicorn in 3 years their own sustainability might get challenged because eventually any kind of b2b business requires service uh, to be provided to the customer you know whatever yeah. software you give or anything yeah ritu i i totally agree that's why they got to build the organization i mean sure. get good hr people from the software service companies the bpo companies so build organization we have grown 30 40% we know how to handle growth you may be growing 80 90% get them Correct. yes because you know they know how to look into the two or three year future they know how to hide past they know how to empower them put them in place blah 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 remember if you are a bpo company in this country you are like an airport terminal people came in people went the key <laughs> is to keep them together in the terminal giving them all the goodies and the shops to make sure they stay as long as possible <laughs> because you were having attrition of 45 50 60% right and you were handle sure. that you know how to handle that you know how to handle growth correct yeah that's that's so, true so, so get get uh, get uh, uh, get people get good yeah. people see you got to build the team hr is extremely important technology is important hr is important sales and marketing is important finance is important so what you are doing in 10 years you got to do in 3 years so the key thing is to plan for it build capacity use the capital to build capacity get good leaders and to do it and to understand your own inadequacies many of them is started by first time people who just started a company who never worked before who never grown a company who never know many things they must learn and that's why the investors who invest in them should guide them talk to them and they must listen to the investors and get people better than them and uh, come in the background and handle what they're comfortable and let others run the show but remain in charge so i think you know is a growing up pangs for a lot of these people too too much of stress too much of growth you must set aside ego but remember at the end of the day you know you want a lot of the stock you're going to benefit the most if you let somebody else run for you if you get a good ceo who can do things much better for you and you want most of the stock man you are going to be walking to the bank and counting all the cash not the ceo the ceo is going to get a little <laughs> bit of options and little bit of cash and you know he may be happy but you are going to be the happiest why should you be the ceo and say hey i'm the founder i want to be the ceo i want to be the biggest guy hand it to somebody who is much better and if they do a greater job you benefit the most so this little piece yeah. of understanding has to come to people sure particularly startup founders from the look of yeah. it when you grow because you know you got to understand your own inadequacies your own inability to handle yes. growth it's not easy yeah. Yeah, I mean, one can be a good engineer, but not necessarily a, the best sales I've seen in my around. career, people who are heroes become zeros in three years. Mm. Because they were heroes yeah. handling X. When X become 3X in three years, four years, they're out of place because they not, don't grow the same pace the company grows. This is a problem with a lot of startups. 80-90% of people don't grow at the pace the company grows. So when you hire sure. person, you must make sure that person has the capacity to handle a assign same assignment at 10x the scale because you could be 10x in 3 4 years totally yeah and if you think so the person is so where are you putting your bets on what kind of tech companies are you betting on right now particularly for 2021 um is it b2b or b2c you see more uh, action happening i think uh, we got uh, see we got three kind of companies b2c pure tech 
and B2B. Pure, pure tech like cloud and others and B2B and B2B2C. We are putting 20, 25% into B2C, but B2C is brutal. You require yes. more and more capital. B2B success depends on the ability to get more and more capital, how you're going to spend time raising more capital. Whereas B2B product creation, marketing are the key and it's a long-term game. You have to wait patiently four to five years. But this COVID has given a wind in the sails. And then you've got the pure tech companies using great technology in the cloud, in AI and others. Well, you got to find out how people are going to use that and all that. So we have got a, a allocation between all of them. And uh, we are, we are, don't, we have an allocation, but we are not so, uh, you know, uh, so rigid. All right. We take it case to case, but then the other day as venture capitalists, we want to make a lot of money. Sure. Right. So we are not very rigid. We feel a company is good in a particular place. You invest in the company. For example, we invested in a company called Mitro. Mitro is a fantastic company with great tech. And they're right. growing very fast. They got 35 million downloads, blah, blah, blah. And now everything is slowed down, but they're still growing. And they got fantastic technology, a great team. And we're very happy with uh, what they have done because they're yes. going to win the battle to be the next uh, you know, social media giant, giant because they got capability, great products, everything. And of course, the upsurge happened when the Chinese were banned. Now they're stabilizing. So they will stabilize. They will grow up again. So I think you, know, you pick the winners and you stay with them. But the biggest thing is you must mentor them. Right. They require a lot of mentoring. They require okay. mentoring for strategy, for execution, for hiring people, etc. You know, we got a company called Better Place. Better Place is a fantastic company, the largest uh, blue-collar workforce company with a SaaS platform. They're doing extremely well. They just raised capital and they're going to get more capital soon. They're India's largest. They use this COVID time to reconfigure the business, get on more scale, get on more people on board reconnect with the customers. Now everybody is hiring. They're doing extremely well. So you have to mentor them. You have to spend time with them, put the building blocks, create this uh, organization chart, the network, and uh, keep talking. So, you know, uh, I mean, you know, while uh, as an investor, you, you've got such sharp lenses to sort of understand, most importantly, which is the most, uh, you know, the most, uh, uh, I would say, the, the most problematic area in this whole situation, which is to mentor and sort of re-mentor the startup time and again. Now, if, you know, let's say if the India's old wealth were to sort of look at investing themselves in startups to help them grow, to help them multiply, what do you think, how do you think one, it can happen best? And secondly, you know, what is it particularly, you know, so if somebody has built a large company, let's say maybe even 30 years ago, 40 years ago, um, how can they best mentor or what capabilities can they bring to the startups if they're working with them closely? Look, I would like to tell all these people with big family money, people who sold their companies who got cash, don't try to start a fund, hire somebody and run it yourself. Yeah. Because running a fund requires a particular kind of person who feels that he is the, he's going to get the carry and the carry takes a lot of time to get money. You know, they need to have the passion, energy to last it out. It's an eight to 10 year holding. And if you think you've got a money and you can hire a manager, pay money and give a little bit of carry and hope he'll work for you, it's not going to work. But every good manager wants to run his own fund, right? That's the thing for them. They don't want to work for anybody else. So what you need to do if you've got money is to invest in five to ten funds. Pick up the funds. Talk to a lot of funds. Ask them to come and present to people funds that you who are, uh, you know, well, people who are confident, people who can raise money, people who have got it. And across a lot of funds, act like a fund of funds. Invest in eight to ten funds. And, you know, they will... Meet you, ask them to meet you quarterly, look at all the companies, pick up some of those companies and then to tell them you want to talk to them, mentor them, give them experience, share your ideas and work with them. I'm sure those uh, industry companies, when they see a good person, will want to work with you, will want to talk to you, will want to learn because they're eager to get your experience and help them out. And when they grow, invest in them directly because you right. know where they are, what they are, etc. If you think you're going to search and do everything, it's going to be difficult. For example, we sure. run 14 funds. We got 250, 275 companies invested, $450 million invested between all of them. We have put in $150 million, right? Baiju was a company. We put in the first check seven, eight years ago. All right. right. We farm easy. We put in nearly the first check. So we given, we got a lot of these winners, but you know, we, we believe that even though we are good at picking, we rather work through many funds because we'll have so many fund managers working for you. They're going to serve, they're going to do everything and you pick the best that is there and you put in more money in follow-ons and others 
where you get good opportunities once they come to a certain size. Because the initial stages require a lot of hard work. Not everybody is going to be a winner. But if you put the funds, you go at the fund level, then you diversify when you get the best companies to come. They'll all come to you because they're anyway going to raise capital. Right. So you got the money, they'll come to you, but you got to be communicative. We get 3,000 companies visiting our office every year, 3,000. All right, we got a small team of people who created software to make sure which to, which to talk to, what to do, everything. They become experts. They're all young people, but they become experts using technology. They can find out. And remember, if you are a legacy player with a lot of money because you sold a company and you've got ancestral wealth, how to connect with young people is difficult. Even for me, even though I've been in mm. technology for the greater part of my life, connecting with young people is difficult because many of them will not open their mouth. They will not talk to you openly. You know, they are sometimes shy. It takes a lot of time. They feel intimidated, right? So if you think that you're going to run everything, you're going to do everything, it's difficult. So work through this method, but invest here. This is going to be the growth area. These right. are going to be the winners. Like the US has got 250 unicorns. India has got 41 unicorns. We'll have 100 unicorns by 2025, maybe 150. Right. Maybe 150 by 2025. So pick mm. the winners, invest in them, hang on, and you'll make a lot of money and you'll be ex very exciting for you. Sure. So we've also got some questions coming from our audience, uh, Mr. Pai. Um, you know, let me ask you this. So uh, yeah. one is that, uh, what is your view on the government's current and sudden change stance on the online gaming industry? You know, online gaming is flirting with illegality and money. Okay. You know, betting and, you know, giving money and all kind of stuff, which is at the borderline of the law. So they need to be careful. And their revenue model is very clear. You can download a game, you can play the game, and they make money because they sell you, you know, coins, they sell you this, they sell you that, all kind of stuff, right? And mm -hmm. they allow you to bet on winners and all kind of stuff, which is part of the game. We don't have a regulatory regime for that. We don't have everything else. So what I would urge them is create a code of conduct. Socialize the idea with government, social idea with a lot of people. Because if a lot of people lose money, something happens, they go complain. Government is going to come to the rescue. They don't care for you. So government doesn't understand this business. They don't understand it. And you've got to be careful in what you do. Because some of these games are habit forming. You have that POG or whatever it is, right? Which is habit forming. Young people suffer. They did all kind of stuff there. And that can lead to very adverse circumstances. So you've got to uh, play it very carefully and work on that and make sure it happens. And also, Ritu, you've got to form a group to protect your turf. <laughs> I... Yes. We've got a little technical glitch from Mr. Pai's side right now. Um, we'll just... Join us online, a very interesting discussion on the online gaming industry and particularly, you know, how um, it's going to come under regulation as on various other industries as well um, in the coming times. Um, in the meantime, please share your questions. Any questions that you have uh, to ask Mr. Pai, please uh, let us know. Please put them either on Facebook where this program is going on live or you can... Uh, if you're there with us on Zoom, please put it over there so that we can actually go out and ask these questions from him as we wait for him to return back. I'm back. Oh yeah, no, great sir. So I'm saying, I'm saying that you know you need to connect, you need to do many things, and uh, you got to work to it and. And for God's sake, join together to protect your turf. Don't allow these Chinese apps to come through some other country because, you know, globally, companies want to tackle this market. This is your right. market. Work yes. together to protect your market. Well, to you shut out others, I don't want to talk about it. Shut out the Chinese, definitely. The Chinese won't allow you to come to their market. Should shut out yes. others from Europe and others. Look at how, whether you can go to the market, whether you're open, but try to protect your home turf. See, Ritu, you must understand one thing. Just like you protect your physical territory, you must protect your digital territory. Right, absolutely. I mean, digital territory That's... belongs to us. Why should we hand it over to the Chinese? 60% totally. of the apps were Chinese. Why did we hand it over? Don't hand it over to them. The government did a good thing by banning the Chinese apps. I support that for a very important reason. The Chinese don't allow you to come inside. They have this great firewall. They kick you out and they censor you, they control you. Why should we allow them to come? You can work with the free market economy like other economies who allow you to come and start anything else, correct? 
and you can compete with them, but you can't compete with the Chinese. So I think, you know, what is happening here? So learn how to make sure that you get a reasonable share of your home market. We've got another question, sir. Um, again, you know, do you feel that the changes in the farm laws are yeah. correct? And what opportunities does it open for agri startups? You know, I feel the farm laws are very correct for a very important reason. What do the farm laws do? They don't change any existing practice. MSP is not changed. Nothing is changed. And they're only, really, only giving the uh, farmer the freedom to sell where he wants, when he wants, at whatever price. He's not preventing them from going to the mandi and selling it through the same middleman, You're paying the same commission, getting the same MSP. And government is committed to MSP for a simple reason. Government has a commitment to feed 80 crore people with almost free rations. That's not going to go away. So they have to get things to MSP. Correct. Now, this agitation is a political agitation driven by certain political parties and the left. The left tried, left and all these radical elements, they tried the CAA, didn't work. Even the CAA, what did the CAA do? You know, before CAA, there's a, there's a citizenship law that remains as it is. Nothing has changed. All the CAA did was to say, if you belong to this particular category, you come to India before 31st December 2014, you are in India today, we'll give citizenship. It did not say we'll not give citizenship to others. So people created a fake narrative, the same thing they're doing in the farm bill. And as far as startups are concerned, the farm bill will empower the farmer to sell where he wants, what he wants. And of course, there are some rules for the game. You have to pay the farmer within 24, 48 hours. You can't cheat the farmer. You've got to have the contract. Follow the rules and do it. For example, Avishkar has done very well. Ibono has done very well. So, you know, our, uh, you know, Big Basket has done very well. Growfers has done very well. They all set up networks. They all got people in North India and South India. They're doing well. So, Agritex will be a growth area. I've been talking to government to telling them to Niti Ayog that we should have Nabad create a 5,000 crore fund and invest in startups in the Agritech area. Because all the Agritechs who work with farmers so increase farmers' income by 20 30%. They have helped the farmer to grade, sort, create a supply chain, and they go to the farmer's doorstep. They take the goods, pay them on time, and they sell and make losses and subsidize the farmer and the consumer. That's great news because they got capital, but they're doing a good job. So I think we should encourage them. And if you do that, there'll be more competition. There'll be more intensity. And government should put in money there. I've been talking to them for the last one year to do that. I hope they do it now. That would certainly be a big help. Uh, somebody needs to even guide the farmers, you know, if they want to go and sell outside, then, you know, create an avenues for them to be able to. It's happening, it. Ritu. It's happening in Delhi. You know, there's so many places where they created the farmer produce organization. They created places where they can come and everything to come. You see, the problem is wheat and rice are very different because they're procured by the government. Now, the right. startups are working in fruits and vegetables. They're mm -hmm. working in the area of milk. They're working in the area of, uh, you know, animal husbandry, fish and meat, fishing and meat, because, you know, they're outside the MSP. There's a free market there. They're working in those areas. And there's a lot of money to be made by creating efficiency in the supply chain and uh, creating branding and giving the consumer a good thing. Sure. So, sir, we have another question right here by Mrutinjay. He's asking, how can storefront enablers succeed in this time, folks like Bikai, Dukan, Shopify, etc., are suddenly in red ocean. What do you think should be the strategy to sell to SMBs, SMEs, because they still think a lot about shelling out uh, investment money? I think you've got to create a variable pricing model because people are hesitant to put money down for anything. If you create a business process innovation where there's variable pricing, where you get a small part of what they sell and they clearly know that if they don't sell, then you don't get your money and you're able to take some risk and keep the cost of your product down and help them, then it's going to work. See, the important thing is to gain that trust. Many of the SMEs are all fed up with people coming, selling something and disappearing. They want to know what is your stake in the game, how you're going to handle them, how you're going to... So it's a very expensive proposal. By winning the trust and working there, it's a long, hard battle. battle you'll be able to do that. Sure, sir. Because, and you know, finally... they got to see the benefit. They don't have... And lots of money to risk and everything. They're very careful, right? Maybe some of them have been bitten badly. Yeah, it again comes down to your original point of sales and service yeah. by startups, which needs yeah. to um, notch up. So there's another question from Sharaf who says that how the data residential policies are going to affect the online business. I think it's going to be very positive because, you know, globally, every citizen and every country is concerned about the data of the citizens. 
because the data is getting consolidated in the digital monopolies and the digital monopolies are misusing the data they're creating psychometric profiles they're trying to give you a fake narrative they're pushing things they want you to do they want to control your mind and change your behavior and you know everybody is happy with it because nobody knew about it now they know about it because the us election may see in how they were anti trump i'm not pro trump or anti trump but you know they should not interfere in politics that is the kiss of death because now they're going to get it back they're all ganging up all the all the politicians they gang up to beat them up and break them up in uh, using monopoly laws because you can't go after them that is their territory don't take sides they taken sides even in india some other media is taking sides and it's going to be tough because you got to be independent and give everybody an opportunity don't get into politics if you get into politics you will be you have to play that game very differently and you will get hurt right so i think is important so the desa residency law is a way of protecting consumers why should all our data reside in america to research in america is available to the american government the national security agency of america the courts of america who is going to protect us the data is there all we have is a contract and the contract the google or apple is one sided everything in their favor nobody has read the contract in india we all blindly sign the data goes everybody can use who is going to protect the data so in a data residency law but all our data is available here tomorrow there is a misuse of data the data is sold something is done you can always go to the government the government fails go to the court and the supreme court of india has held that data is a part of right to privacy which is a part of right to life under article 19 is protected so government has to have a data residency law because with that data residency law how can they protect us how can they make sure they have access to data i remember many of these payment people were getting the data outside and storing outside rbi came down and told them we want your data to be here we want unqualified access we want to access independently but do it they all protested did the much uh, no no now the key and all that but rbi is very insistent today all the payments data whether you are with foreign providers indian providers are in india they subject to rbi regulations rbi will protect you rbi may be a bit slow but they will always protect this your government your country your courts your rights can be enforced here so data residency law is very good it will keep our data here and government will come with norms to allow indian companies to use it it will not go to the global monopolies outside so it will create a level playing field for indian startups we're almost at the end of our time but i'll take this one very quick question um, uh, where deep is asking that do you think uh, indian companies coming up together to put up their own app store is a good idea um, so i think is a, could... i think is a very good idea for a very important reason because the app store has become a non -com the competitive edge first of all you are in a platform where some may allow you free some say they give me 30% 20% 30% they can turn it off they get shut it down you have no rights you have no rights correct and they don't care a damn about you because they got hundreds of them all they doing it giving access to everybody that's why i want jio to come with an app store and jio is an indian company they will not shut it off very easily right they're right. all in india i want companies like paytm and us to come with an app store so that you know and we and see we need some kind of indian nationalism let's be very clear it's not about competition totally. yeah. it's not about free sure. trade because they don't play fair they don't care a damn about you they'll give it to you free when they are hooked they will manipulate they will do everything they have done it they shut you off right for no reason then they come with some norms they lay down the norms send you a contract say sign once you are overly exposed you are dependent on them you have to sign blindly is a very uncompetitive unfriendly move you may think is friendly because you get it free you can upload and everything then another thing which is important that you get hooked on to their technology all of them have got proprietary technology you get hooked on to their technology and that's a hook you cannot get by how can you ship tomorrow so we need sure. like you had containerization in uh, in uh, in the cloud earlier you went to a cloud provider you depend on the cloud provider you can't get out easily now you got technology called containerization where we create a container on a cloud and tomorrow you want to ship to take the container and ship it to another cloud provider cloud only becomes a platform and a utility so we need that kind of utility for an app store maybe the technology come then you can ship the technology doesn't come you can ship maybe by law you must create a utility like container where you go to an app store everything is within that app store in a container tomorrow they play dirty you can shift it across at your option to somebody else and uh, tell everybody and uh, try to work so i think this app store business is very good there has to be more competition because if in the ios system you can't get out ios is the proprietary system of apple right to be in the app store you got to follow ios you got to follow mm -hmm. their rules you got to listen to them you are no bargaining power you are no bargaining power. i hope the us government breaks it up it's anti competitive right 
You get onto your Facebook, get onto Google. It's very anti-competitive. Google now says we'll charge you for Gmail, we'll charge you for this, blah blah blah. Google Maps is all free now. They're beginning to charge, and tomorrow they can charge yes. whatever they want because you're so dependent on that. Once you build a business model, then how do you shift? So I think you know, Ritu, governments all over the world should declare some of them public utilities. Hmm. Let me give the prob- example of electricity. When electricity first came, private companies did it in the U.S. They provided electricity. Very soon, government decided that electricity is a public utility. Public utility means every member of the public should have access to it. You can't shut it off. They must, of course, pay for it. You can't charge what you want. It must be regulated. And they had a regulator, and they created the public utility. They did the same for telecom, because telecom they said everybody should get access. It's a part of the global network. It's a part of what you should get. You can't kick anybody out. You can't charge more. You got to do a thing. They regulate. Now, even for data. And these platforms and app platform, you need to have a regulatory authority declare them a utility under the law. I want Twitter to be declared a utility because Twitter can shut you off. You have a million followers tomorrow; they shut you off because some media somewhere far away thinks you're doing something wrong. It's very subjective, and there's no right of appeal. They just shut you off, then say do what you want. Then what do you do? Go behind them. So you are shut off from your connections. So I think government also should declare them a public utility because they understand the concept public utility. And say that these are all the obligation, these are all your rights, and there got to be regulations so nobody gets off, everybody gets in. Of course, if you are abusive and everything, they can uh, go after you, give you a notice, you have a right of appeal, blah blah blah. But there has to be a process which is very fair, done independently, so you're not subject to very arbitrary actions. Sure, sir. No, I think that was um, that was a great candid conversation that you sort of gave, and I think some absolutely valuable and you know uh, totally unwavering sort of advice that you've given to startups today. Um, you know, it it truly is has its uh, weight worth in gold, so to say, if startups are able to follow it and. um uh, you know able to put it to use in their own organizations they would be much bigger much faster and they would be of course more stable and sustainable in the times to come so thank you very much for joining thank us you. today uh, sir and uh, you know uh, if anybody i'm getting a lot of questions here they where they want to pitch your areen capital uh, for their startup so if you want to advise them how how is the best way to reach out to you you can let them know email, otherwise email. please okay but otherwise please keep on this chat will be live on facebook for a number of days so therefore kind of uh, please put your questions over there we'll request mr pai's team to kindly sort of help us over here to answer these questions for you thank you very much mr pai thank for you. joining it was wonderful speaking to you today